Hey, you players. I'm super excited to sit down today with an author that I am so happy to know and be friends with. Her name is Michelle Kay. She just wrote a book called Ace Notes, Tips and Tricks on Existing in an Allo World. It's available for pre-order. She is an author who's written for publications like Geeks Out, Catapult, Bitch Media, Electric Lit, The Mary Sue, and more. Michelle, thank you so much for being here. And, uh, you know, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for that amazing introduction. Awesome. Yeah. And I mean, I think that your book is really an important one, I think, for a lot of people to check out and stuff. I'm happy to kind of dive into it and just hear more of the backstory of your experience and stuff and how that influences the book and your writing and all. Um, So you want to kind of just give us a very quick synopsis of what Ace Notes is about? Sure. So Ace Notes is basically a nonfiction book on asexuality, exploring the ins and outs of the orientation and going beyond the one-on-one facts that that most articles tend to go into, which is how asexuality is defined by little to no sexual attraction. For a lot of ace people, this is a great start, but it's not really a lot of information when you're discovering that you're asexual and want to learn more about the culture or the orientation. So this book goes into the deeper layers of that, exploring what it means to be asexual, how to come out as asexual, um, what defines asexual culture, how to deal with ace phobes, and all the like. Basically, this is the book I would have wanted when I first came out as asexual in my teens. So I'm guessing I'm saving future readers the same kind of struggles that I went through as an early reader. Yeah, and I think that's so crucial because, um, you know, in your teenage years, you're in the process of discovering who you are. And a lot of times um, it's hard, especially um, to talk to your parents about those things or if your friends are on their own different journey, they may not fully understand or you may not feel comfortable opening up and sharing things with them. Um, So having kind of a resource or a guide where you can kind of get a better understanding of someone who can relate to you, someone who understands you and someone who can guide you because they went through it when they were younger is so, so crucial. Now, um, for people, for people who don't really know what the term ace means, you use the terms uh, in, in the book ace and allo. Can you kind of explain what those two terms mean? Sure. So ace is basically shorthand for asexual, and asexual means a person who experiences little to no sexual attraction. Versus allo or al- allosexual means like the opposite of asexual, which means the person who does experience sexual attraction. So ace and allo are term, terms that are related to a person's d- level of sexuality or levels of desire for sexuality, right? Not necessarily. Um, so asexuality is defined by sexual attraction, which means you could be gay or homoromantic, which means you have a, experience romantic attraction for the same gender, but still asexual versus um, – you could also be straight or heteroromantic, which means you could experience a tra- romantic attraction to the opposite gender, but still identify as asexual. So you mentioned kind of for yourself growing up as a teenager, you wish you had a guide like this. So what kind of was the inspiration behind the book? And uh, as you were writing it, kind of what pieces of your own story and journey do you feel kind of made their way into your writing? So um, on the note you touched on earlier about how complicated and nuanced sexuality can be, that's actually a really big part of what asexuality is like diving into what exactly is sexual attraction what is romantic attraction because the when you're an asexual person sometimes you experience things you experience those things differently than you would as an allo person and so as an ace person i got to deep dive into the nuances of that into the book so basically that's part of what the inspiration of the book was like wanting to see those nuances explored in writing um, as a teenager, I didn't really see a lot of representation of what asexuality meant. Um, mind you, this is before Bojack Horseman's famous Todd Chavez, who is, by all accounts, an amazing asexual character. But again, he didn't exist when I was in high school, unfortunately. So um, I, I found out about it through just a random Google search, which definitely helped me a lot. But I kind of like... When I was going through libraries, when I was going through book lists, I kept searching for like characters who represented me and reflected my experiences, and they didn't. And when I was writing about that in my journalism, I realized that there's an audience of people who also agree with this and who also are craving that information. And so when I found out about the opportunity to submit a book proposal on asexuality, I thought, why not? 
So when it comes to representation and finding representation in media, in books and, and TV shows, um, I'm sure when you were younger, you didn't really see it as much. And now I think that we have more representation now more than ever. And I think going forward in the future, we're going to have even more, which is, I think, an amazing thing because it allows more people to feel seen and represented. Um, just look for yourself looking around in different media outlets and things happening in the media. Do you see any ace representation in characters or things that you kind of like are happy about? See, that's a really tricky question to answer because the number of canonically asexual characters on film and television can be counted on one hand, unfortunately. We still haven't gotten up to getting the same type of representation as other members of the LGBTQ community, um, such as gay and bisexual characters, which also need more representation, by the way. But there is a large growing population of asexual characters within young adult fiction, for which I'm entirely grateful for. Um, titles by authors such as Claire Kahn and Darcy Little Badger are definitely expanding the field of asexuality within fiction. I wanted to talk about kind of the relationship piece in, in being ace. So something I talk a lot about on my channel is relationships and how to talk to people you like and how to form them and things like that. And I think that even for myself, um, kind of exploring relationships from an ace perspective is not something I've explored, which I definitely feel like I need to do more of. <laughs> um, but I want to hear from you. Yeah, I think you have more experience in kind of talking about it, personal experience, and then also kind of your written experience here in the book. Um, how, how does being ace play into forming a re relationship with someone? And what does that look like? For me as an ace person, it's definitely been tricky navigating relationships because oftentimes if you're a person who wants to be in a romantic relationship and you're in the dating world you have to balance that with certain expectations um let's say you're 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 in a field with mostly allo partners and they experience sexual attraction and they desire um sexual experiences versus you being an asexual person which by the way Ace people can have sex. I mean, many ace people are comfortable with it. They do so for a number of reasons, from wanting to have children the traditional way versus wanting to please a partner. But there are also aces who are sex repulsed too, which who, which means that they're not comfortable with that type of physical activity. So that means balancing certain expectations versus balancing your own comfort levels, which, as you can imagine, can be pretty tricky. And in terms of the playing field of being an ace person who wants to date another asexual person versus dating an allo person, the field of dating, it's, it's like comparing a tiny, tiny pool to like a wider ocean. Right. It's like so two needles trying to find themselves in a haystack. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and and I think you you mentioned something that uh, I'm I'm more curious to understand more. So you mentioned that um, is for someone who 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 is ace, they um, may still participate in things like sex and and um, so so so. What degree would you say? Uh, and obviously, it's probably a varying degree. Um, would you say people? Um, engage in terms of kind of romantic interactions so things like kissing and hugging and all the way up to, to sex let's say uh would you say it's it's such a varied spectrum there within within uh the ace community it's definitely a varied spectrum it's up to every individual to determine their boundaries and their comfort levels um for some aces they don't see kissing as primarily sexual they see it as like another form of affection so an ace person can feel comfortable kissing in one scenario versus another ace person who absolutely does not want it at all. For a lot of people that watch my channel and that are engaged in my audience and community, we're all very open-minded people who want to learn and grow. Um, but sadly, I feel like there's a lot of people within society who don't operate that way. Uh, they are very rigid and like, no, you're this, you're that, you're confused, you're th you know, there's a lot of projection onto, onto other people. What they may be uncomfortable with or uncertain about or confused or scared. Um, and I think that when it comes to like some of the things that uh, allo people might be surprised by to learn about asexual people, what would be some of those things that um, that maybe in their traditional way of thinking that if they heard or learned about, it would totally like change their perspective or, or shake things up for them? Yeah, I feel like there's a few misconceptions about asexuality and asexual people that I definitely had to experience, um, primarily which that as an asexual person, I'm more immature than the general population. 
um, this is just ties into the way that asexual people are often infantilized because they don't share the same experiences as other people. Um, the people who are not interested in sex are often t um, infantilized because we're not seen as full adults. Um, in our society, oftentimes we equate maturity with with sexual experiences, which may be true for some people, but otherwise it's just, I equate it as just another experience in the full life of, life spectrum of experiences. So let's say a person has never had sex their entire life. That doesn't mean they're immature. That does not mean that they are not a fully capable functioning adult who has not experienced a deep range of experiences because sexuality does not equal maturity. Um, sex does not mean that you're just some Peter Pan waiting to grow up, you know? It's just another life experience that you may or may not have. I think you touched on something really important. It's like we do in society equate uh, kind of this display of sexuality and trying to, you know, um, just kind of ooze it out of your being. You, you must be sexual. I, I, I know even from like from from um, a lot of the, the young young teens or young guys that, that I talk to, there is obviously this stigma in society for men that like uh, a man is defined as a man if he can get a lot of girls or sleep with a lot of girls or he's always pursuing girls. And if you're not, if you're someone that is not interested at whatever stage of your life, you're viewed as lesser of a man. And this is actually a concern for a lot of asexual men who are told that they do are not real men if they identify as asexual because when you're a man, you're expected to be this very hot-blooded sexual creatures, often a very dominant type of creature. And for a lot of ace men who are discovering their asexuality, this is entire this warps with the idea of manhood that they grew up perceiving, and it makes them feel lesser, and it makes them often doubt that they can be asexual because that is not what they taught that a man should be, which is very painful and obviously very toxic for just the general scope of people who identify as male or are assigned male at birth. Dealing with people who don't understand it or who say, like, that doesn't make sense to me. You know, like you said before, you're confused, all these different terms. How do you kind of manage those type of conversations or relationships with people in your life? For me, it's I definitely dealt with trolls um, who have been acephobic, which is the word for people who um, express prejudice or negative attitudes towards asexuality. Um, I dealt with a number of trolls from both the straight community and queer community, unfortunately. Um, you would think that being a, a marginalized person would make you less inclined to bully other marginalized people, but unfortunately there are biases within every community. And so as an ace person, I've often had to educate. Um, for the people who don't want to listen, the people who would just like dismiss everything I say despite my experiences or despite my beliefs or, or my thoughts, um, oftentimes it has to deal, do with having both an innate sense of self in which like you have the confidence to assure yourself, even if they don't believe you, you still believe you. And you can hold down to that even in a world that doesn't perceive you as real, which is often easier said than done, unfortunately, for which um, the other point is resources. Having representation that affirms your identity, such as the pop culture that we discussed, having characters who look like you and reflect your experiences can definitely help you feel less alone, as well as online and IRL communities of asexual people who can you know, say, hey, I've gone through this too, and I believe you, and I don't doubt you, and I know you're valid. For me, that definitely has come through with being a part of a wider asexual community, like saying whenever like I have to deal with an ace phobic troll I can just say oh this has happened to me and they will be there to comfort me and has been a tremendous relief and I also would like to highlight the allies too like people who have who are not asexual in my life have definitely been there to support me too so that's also been a really great relief and hopefully this book will help educate allies on how to support their asexual friends or partners yeah and and, and I, I'd love to talk a little bit more about that how can a person be a good ally to someone who is ace, uh, especially if they see ace phobia in play and, and what can they do to be more supportive? Well, the first step would be to listen. <laughs> if an asexual person is brave enough to tell you who they are and to talk about their experiences, your first step is not to immediately negate what they're saying. Like, like saying, 
Oh my, have you ever tried having sex with someone? Because that is often the first question someone asks when someone comes out as asexual. Or have you tried this? Have you tried that? Do you need medication? Which is often tied to pathologization of asexuality, which is very painful. Um, so the first step would be not to ask ignorant questions, which you can look up online. There are a number of articles that say that talk about what not to say to an asexual person that you can look up. Being able to kind of just hear someone's experience, understand it's their experience. Uh, and if, if you do have questions, what would be a good way to engage uh, in asking questions without coming off rude or uh, invasive in some way? Well, the first step would be, can I ask you this question? And if this person says, no, I'm not comfortable talking about this question, to just let it be and not continue pushing. That would be a very good step. Um, the other times would be, could you possibly explain to me in your own words what asexuality means to you? Because that is a very generalized question that other person can provide their own specific answers to. What, would, what advice would you give to someone to pursue someone, let's say, in a relationship that, it, that, they, that the person they're pursuing is ace? Mm. Well, if you're an owl person who is interested in a person who's asexual, um, oftentimes the first step would be to understand their own comfort levels. If you're already with, um, if you're already in the knowledge that they're asexual, then perhaps ask them what would you be comfortable with in the future? Is kissing on the table? Are certain acts on the table? Don't just make assumptions right off the bat of what they won't or won't do with their body. Um, many asexuals, again, as I said, are open to having sex because they have that comfort level with it. And again, many asexuals are not. So the first thing would be not to make any assumptions. The th second thing would just, in general, just be have an open and honest conversation about it. If you're unsure of something, please go ahead and ask the other person, what can I do to make you comfortable? And what can we do to make sure that this healthy, that this relationship will be healthy on both sides? Um, for a lot of ace allo couples there, or people who are in non, non just monogamous relationships, they have to have to try out different ways of approaching romantic partnership um, in, in non nuclear traditional ways. Um, some couples, open up the relationship, um, remaining romantically monogamous, but perhaps sexually open. Other times um, they seek outside sources, going to sexual workshops, sex toys. Um, it's trying to find whatever compromise that will make sure both parties are satisfied and comfortable. One other thing I want to say is that you are never entitled to someone sexually. What you just said about how an an ally person can be an ally to ace people, I think ties into the fact that often ace people, when they're entering relationships, are often expected to be sexual no matter what. That's the first expectation that people have, that an ace person will always compromise, compromise often in here being um, in quotations, because they're not expected to have their comfort level respected. They're always expected to please the other per person who may be sexual. And that is for me, an unfair expectation, listening to both parties' concerns, validating both parties' physical and mental boundaries is oftentimes the crucial step in developing any healthy relationship, romantic or otherwise. It's a good practical way to approach that situation. I think a lot of people uh, feel most comfortable when they have kind of a step-by-step -step process. Okay, I should try this, I should try that, and they have it outlined. And I think that's what's great about your book too, because it does operate with these sharing these tips and tricks and step by step. But uh, one thing I wanted to also ask was for someone who's non asexual, what do you think would be the biggest takeaway or something that they can really like learn or, or, or get a, a bigger perspective on from from reading your book? Maybe it'll help explain like what sexual what asexuality means to a person, um, how it's oftentimes not experiencing this hunger that apparently other people experience. Um, one description I use for asexuality is that you are at a silent disco and everyone is wearing these headphones and they're tuned into one station versus an asexual who's perhaps tuned into another station. They can still dance. They can still enjoy music and enjoy life. They're just not tuned into that frequency. For anyone that's watching this that is asexual and they are looking for a community or someone who just wants to be an ally and be part of those communities, where would you recommend they turn to? Like where online, where in person, what would be some resources for that? 
there are a number of asexual bl bloggers online who talk about the experiences and who have built communities surrounding those experiences online. So you can type in asexual and see what other people are talking about it as well. Um, for me, oftentimes there are local resources for asexual communities, such as ACES NYC, which is an asexual community based in New York as well as ACES Los Angeles, which is based in California. So oftentimes you can check out those resources that are specifically out there or have perhaps go to an LGBT community center near you and asking what resources they have available. Um, I'm not saying it's the easiest thing in the world to find community, but that community definitely exists out there. One of the coolest experiences I ever had as an asexual writer was when I wrote it, um, an article on asexuality for what's it called Hey Alma, and a person all the way from Uruguay told me how much she loved the piece, and now we're friends to this day. The most important question I have is, because I'm sold, I think your book is, is amazing, and I think people will really, really love it. So where can people get it? It's available for pre-order right now. I'll have the link down below. Where can people pick it up? You can pick it up on Barnes & Nobles, you can pick it up on Amazon, you can pick it up on the publisher's website, which is Jessica Kingsley Publishers. Just type in the title into Google search and you will definitely find a few places where to buy it. And please do buy it because I am a writer who depends on their writing for a living. Michelle, thank you so much for taking the time to talk, uh, to share what your book is about, what your life experience is about, and to give, I think, so many wonderful tips and tricks uh, on existing in an LO world <laughs> for for people who, who, who are part of my audience. And thank you again. I really am so, so grateful to have you. Thank you. And I definitely hope this book will be a helpful resource for those people who are asexual, who are questioning, and even those who are not, on how to be better allies to the people that they love and care about in their life. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll catch you next time. As always, love and peace.